This episode of Beauty and the Surgeon podcast is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked is an online company dedicated to making professional health testing easy and accessible. Let's Get Checked offers fast, affordable, completely confidential at-home health tests from a range of tests from STDs, male and female hormones, and even COVID-19. Listeners of our podcast who are new to Let's Get Checked get 20% off by using our URL, trylgc.com beauty, and be sure to use the code beauty20 at checkout. That's try lgc.com, T-R-Y-L-G-C.com slash beauty, B-E-A-U-T-Y, and be sure to use the code beauty20, beauty20 at checkout. Do it. Getting tested is important. It's the responsible thing to do, and you know how important I think it is to make sure you understand your labs. Welcome everyone to Beauty and the Surgeon podcast. I'm Amy. I'm a nutritional therapy practitioner, and I'm joined today, as always, by Dr. Jason Martin. He's a board-certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Dr. Martin, how are you doing? I'm feeling pretty good about episode 112. I am too. I, I'm excited about this episode. It's not going to be a super interesting one to watch, but if you are interested in watching this episode and you're listening, you can find us on YouTube at Jason Martin MD. Um, there are not there are some slides that go along with it, but there's no fun pictures this time. So if you're just listening, you're not missing a whole lot. <laughs> it's an informational episode, but yeah. it's very important. FDA when they release guidance, I mean, this should be talked about on this podcast. It should, and you know, we've talked about breast implants quite often on the podcast in the past, but this is new labeling that actually goes into effect at the very end of November of 2021. So if you're listening to this, it'll be released right around that time. So. All this new regulation is in effect when you're listening to this podcast. And it is, there's some good changes and it's, yeah, I think we just dive right into this one. Quick question. Why would the FDA be coming out with this guidance? That is something we cover in this podcast. Okay, perfect. <laughs> that is covered in this podcast. <laughs> That's a good question, Dr. Martin. Let's, yeah, I mean, yeah. why now? Why, that's actually one of the slides. Love so it. let's first talk about what has changed. So what are we talking about when we say that there's new labeling around breast implants? There's a few things, and there's not that many, but the the main things are that there's new labeling that includes what's called a box warning, or the very scary term black box warning, is mandatory to be on the box of the breast implant. There is a mandatory patient checklist that has to be filled out. So the implant manufacturers are only allowed to sell to physicians who follow this checklist, who use, utilize this checklist. There's also been updated MRI and screening recommendations now starting at five to six years. I love it's still five to six years for your first breast MRI and then every two to three years after. <laughs> yeah, I think that was like sooner beforehand, but they didn't, I don't know. I have to go back and look. This has changed a couple of times it has. since I've been in practice. Yep. Well, and the, I mean, really breast MRI was not really done when you first started. I mean, it's kind of been a new thing even since you've yeah, been in practice. Yeah, the past 10 years I'm talking yeah. about. Um, the coil that they need. There has to be a listing of the chemicals that can be released from breast implants and essentially like the ingredients or the chemicals that make up the breast implant shell and the filling um, has to be disclosed and that it can be released. And manufacturers have 30 days. I kind of mentioned that from October 27, 2001 to update these things on their website and on the boxes. So if you look at this, this mandatory patient checklist is probably the big thing that you know they're really enforcing. Uh, the MRI recommendations definitely changed. MRI is the gold standard for evaluating uh, implants, specifically silicone breast implants, especially in the case of uh, concern, like if you have concern about rupture. The chemicals that can be released, I thought was very interesting that they added these on there. And also the chemical makeup of these implants, it's probably not as many as you think, but uh, it would be interesting to know that. And then in terms of the uh, updated info on the websites, I mean, that's they they had required stuff like this before for the manufacturer, and this is an expansion of what they required before. Yeah, the FDA had recommend or had requirements prior to this. It's just that these updates have to go into effect, and I think specifically the black box labeling is new. You know, that's and we'll talk more about what that is in a moment. I think an interesting thing before we have talked about the you know the chemicals or the fear of silicone and breast implants in the past, and you know silica or silicone is pretty much an inert substance. However, there are obviously other chemicals that are used in the manufacturing, specifically of the shell. I don't even know what that word was. I just said specifically. I don't know. What, what, what did you say? <laughs> specifically you of go. the there shell. You go. Keep working on <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, specifically of the shell that you know could potentially be released. And I think people don't always think about that. You think that something is inside you. You don't always think that like something could be coming off of it. Yeah, leaching, off gassing, all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, if and I'm not comparing it to plastics, but like just the data that came out with BPA and plastics. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, chemicals leach off of different things now. We've talked about breast implants like 
extensively in the past. If you go to our previous uh, episodes, one is on breast implant selection, and we talk about manufacturing there. The other one, I believe, is on problems with breast implants or breast implant problems. I forget the name of it. It's called breast implant controversies. Controversies, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a lot more salacious I title. Said, yeah, I know, but I send that episode to patients so often. That's why I know. Oh, okay. it's one I send to I, I kind of like controversies frequently. better. That was good. Well, but it's not really controversial. It's more like, you know. Yeah, I know. It, was, yeah. it draws me in. Yeah, What's right? the controversy? Like, what is the controversy? Yeah, so when we talk about BIA, ALCL, which I'm sure we'll get to in this, mm-hmm. and then BII, which is breast implant illness. We talked about both of those in that episode. If you are watching this episode and you have interest in those topics, definitely go watch that episode too. But... Um, in, in reality, there's even though silicone is inert and silicone breast implants or saline breast implants both all have a silicone exterior shell. Uh, shell, we talked about that manufacturing process. And do you remember, Amy, the tool they used to make it? Oh, a, ma- the, a mandel. The dipper thing. Yep. What's it called? A mantle or mandel? I think it was a mandel. Yeah. Yep. I like remember, dips, yeah. Dips the implants. I remember we were talking to the rep. The rep yeah. was like, it's a mandel. I was like, what? It's like, this is a common instrument that people use in our like society. Can- in candy making, too. Yeah. Like, that's what they used to, like, dip I know, candy. He, he, he sounded like everyone talks about mandels all the time. Like, you can go to Costco and get yeah. a couple mandels, make your own implants. Um, <laughs> well. Yeah, so we talked about that. But, you know, clearly, when they make these, and, and they, they make these specifically the shells, that's not even including the silicone gel, there's obviously going to be additives in there. And, I remember there were some salts that they talked about, maybe it, aluminum. It's curing, the curing salts. Curing salts mm-hmm. and that things like that. That was specifically for the texture. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the textured and some other for the smooth. So I think that including these is a step in the right direction. Yeah. Um, all of these things are, are educational. Like none of these things I think are scary. You know, they're all things that enhance the educational component of this. I mean, it's pretty much everything we do. We don't list the ingredients, uh, but we talk about – Basically, the box warnings, and I know we'll get to this, but we talk about all that stuff already. None of this is really going to change the way we do our consults and talk to people about implants. Yeah. Well, before we get into the the black box warning, because I think that's probably what freaks people out the most, let's talk about what a class three device is, because a breast implant is a class three device. I have a little pyramid here that kind of shows that in the United States, there are three classes of FDA. So a Band-Aid's included in a class? Class, Yeah, class one. So class one are, are things that are you know, primarily completely inert, like a wheelchair is a medical device, but it is a class one. So is a Band-Aid. So are crutches. You know, all of these things are class one. Class two involves things that are in kind of two categories. I think it's it's in the UK or in the EU where they have A and B in class, class B, A, class B, you know, I don't even know what I'm saying. I feel like we're talking about RVs. Yeah. I I have that feeling. The models of cars. Yeah. Um, And then actually... uh, It's either in Canada or Europe where there's a class four as well. So in the United States, it's just three classes. But within class B, there are things that require ongoing device reporting that are more invasive devices, essentially, and things that don't. So like in this picture, it's syringes, right? Those could cause harm um, in a way that a Band-Aid cannot. Um, So they have to maybe be tracked differently than like a blood pressure cuff. I mean, you could technically harm someone with that, but it would be Be user error. Yeah, like severe user error, but you could. Class three, the the picture shows actually that's pacemaker. So pacemakers, anything that's implanted is a class three device. So class three is about 10% of all medical devices, which makes sense when you think that Band-Aids are in the bottom tier. Like there's a lot of stuff down there. They require ongoing device reporting. So for the history of the device, the FDA requires that they be continual monitoring and continual device reporting. So that is a unique thing to to class three. They also are classified as devices that help sustain or support life, can be implanted, breast implant, and or present potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. So that's what a class three device is. So it doesn't mean that's not a scary thing in and of itself that a breast implant is a class three device, so it's a pacemaker. Yeah, but saying that uh, you're a, yeah, like a breast implant is equivalent to uh, a spinal cage that you would put in for scoliosis. Oh, I'm not saying that they're. Ma- I don't. I don't no, mean I understand, the necessity but, of no, them. I understand. I'm saying class three. The problem with class three is this should be class three A, B, C, D, and E. Like you know, at the level of invasiveness and the level of concern that you might have with these devices. Potentially, but there is a pretty extreme risk of breast implants 
that we'll talk about. I mean, that right. is there's only from breast implants. So All literally right. that- Am I disagreeing with you? What I'm saying is, <laughs> is that equating one implant to another gets very problematic. It does. Okay. And that's why like in Canada, I think it's Canada that right. has class four. So I mean, yes. Like how many times have we seen commercials on TV, class action lawsuits against mm -hmm. this- bladder sling or that was know, fda approved what was the um knee replacement it was uh, the hip the, the hip, hip that would did, like degrade bone degrade yeah. bone and, and well, the that bladder kind of slings stuff were terribly i mean problematic you know some of those things are pretty severe so but that's yeah. why they require ongoing monitoring right i'm just saying equating yeah. all of them into one little box can be concerning to someone who maybe doesn't understand the nuances between each of these things Let's move on. That's okay. <laughs> well, no. I'm correct. I mean, wrong. No, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I yeah. mean, there are life-saving devices in that category, like a pacemaker. Right. I don't think anyone would be afraid to get a pacemaker. No, this, for example, a personal example. Okay. My dad has Parkinson's disease. He has a deep brain stimulator. Class okay? three? That's a class three device. They actually put a filament into your brain. That's a lot more involved and has a lot more risk than putting in a breast implant. Okay. Does, are you understanding what I'm saying? Well, yeah, I agree If with a breast you. implant gets infected, that's in your soft tissue. If a brain uh, stimulator gets infected in your brain, you can literally die from that, like literally. So, but the point is, is that they have to have a cutoff and the cutoff really comes to those things that, for example, on implants that are literally implanted in your body. And all implants have that that concern. Yeah, they're fear. implanted. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, that's, I was agreeing with you that it yeah. shouldn't be seen as a scary thing right. because- just by the mere fact of it being implanted makes it a, a class three. And the good part about that is, is then there's continuing monitoring, which is actually really good by the FDA. Exactly. So let's take a quick break before we dive into the, the creepy black box. And we'll be right back. I'm very scared. You should, yep, <laughs> scary. <laughs> Dr. Martin, I'm super excited to talk about our sponsor for this podcast. Let's get checked. You, If you've been a listener of our podcast, you know that we have never had a sponsor before, and that's because we're an educational podcast. We're not looking to monetize, and we also would never recommend something that we didn't believe in and or use ourselves. So basically, you're saying we're very choosy. We're very choosy yeah. when we come to our less good... Or our testing, but yeah. let's get checked is really aligns with our values. We talk a lot about monitoring your blood values of certain things. We talked recently about vitamin D serum levels. We talk a lot about hormone levels, and it's hard for some people to get to a lab or you're afraid of the blood draw or just, you know, you're concerned about confidentiality, like you have a lot of concerns and you just don't do it. Let's Get Checked makes it super easy because it's completely confidential. You do it from your home. So there's really no excuse not to do it. Yeah, and we did it recently. Both Amy and I did it. She looked at her women's health, um, basically her hormone levels. And I looked at mine on the men's health side with testosterone. It was very simple. You go online, their online um, interface is really easy to use and good. Uh, we got the testing kit very quickly and the test itself, actually doing the stick, you do a stick on the end of your finger is not hard to do. It only took about three to four minutes. You put it back in a sealed envelope that's confidential, goes back to them. You get your results in two to five days. It's really that simple. And the best part is it's about empowerment, about you taking control and trying to do things that are positive for your health and life. And this is one way to do it literally from the comfort of your own home. Yeah, so they offer a wide range of tests. So they do men's and women's hormone panels. They do a full panel of STD testing. They also are now offering a COVID-19 test at home. So there are a lot of other just basic blood levels that you can get tested as well. And one of the things that we always say is you can't track what you don't check. So you might not know what's normal for you in the future if you're not checking it now, especially as it relates to hormones and men's health specifically, I feel like is a little bit under treated. I mean, oh, but, yeah. you know, sperm crowns are dropping by a large percentage in men these days. Most men um, struggle at some point in their lifetime with low testosterone. And those men do not know what the symptoms of low testosterone are. Depression, anxiety, sleep problems, osteopenia or loss of bone loss of muscle and something we treat all the time, gynecomastia or male breast growth. These are real problems that can be, been, you know, that can be improved or treated with testosterone. And these men do not know their levels. It's so easy to get checked. And this is why we're so excited about the sponsor. Yeah, and Let's Get Checked is a completely CLIA certified lab, the CLIA lab. So they're a well-established, completely safe lab to use. You do get contacted after, so you get your results. I got a text at 4.30 in the morning, which I loved, uh, that my results were ready. And we're both up at 4.30, yep, so, so that I was, was good. Super excited. And you have access to a, not only a nurse, but also a physician. So a physician does review your results, and it gives you a little breakdown of like where you're sitting on those levels. Um, Dr. Martin's had even comparisons of like where two of the levels should be in relation to each other, which is a really important thing to note. Right. You know, Just being within the normal range is not always enough. So it really gave more information than that 
Uh, you'd still want to, of course, reach out to your own doctor if you needed some additional assistance with these labs or you did see something that was concerning. Um, we didn't, thankfully. So that was good. Yeah, yeah. We, were all, we were both good. You know, this podcast is about empowerment. It's educational in my private practice. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. We are all about empowerment and this is one way to do it. So we're very excited about the sponsorship and we're looking forward to using it for our patients moving forward. Yeah, so as a listener of our podcast, if you're also a new time user to Let's Get Checked, which a lot of you probably are, we do have a 20% discount code. So you do need to go to our specific URL and it is linked in the description box below, but it's going to be try LGC, so T R Y L G C, like let's get checked, dot com slash beauty, B E A U T Y. And you'll need to use the code beauty20 at checkout. Beauty again is B E A U T Y 220. And you can pick a test, like any test you'd like, put in our code and get your test shipped to you. Getting tested is the right thing to do. It's uh, lets you know where you're at and what's responsible. All right. Well, let's get tested. Let's get tested. Let's get checked. Let's get checked. <laughs> Hey, we're back. Let's get checked. Let's get checked. If you are actually, let's get checked. Do they do um, C-reactive protein? Oh, that's a really good question. We should have looked that up beforehand. Yeah, I should have looked that up. Because if you are concerned that you might be having issues with any type of implanted device, one of the things you can check is your um, C-reactive protein levels to see if you're having like general systemic inflammation. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. We'll look at yeah, that. Yeah. So there's definitely multiple markers of systemic inflammation, but I think C-reactive protein is the one of the most common ones they check. And it's an easy one. Like it's a normal lab. Right. And it's not going to cost too much money. Yeah. So side side point. Side All right. point. Before we get into the, the black box warning. So what is a, a – it's actually technically called a boxed warning, but it has nicknamed the black box warning. And the, I mean, because a black box denotes like a plane crash, right? Oh, or death, right? Like something of death, yeah. right? Black box. Like, it's very menacing. Yeah. But I think that's probably for effect, right? They want to get your attention. Well, exactly. The very yeah. first thing. Boxed warnings are noticeable, easy to read and understand. So that is the main purpose. So it's something that anybody, the physician and the patient can read and easily understand. I think you, most of us uh, have gotten the pamphlet maybe that comes with a medication and it's literally like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, yeah. Of like 0.5 font. Where you're like, okay, I'm going to read this. You know you're getting old when you take a picture of it and then like you do zoom, it, it up. zoom it yeah. up. So, yeah. You, you know. doing that yet, Nils? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not no. easy to understand, yeah. though. I, I wouldn't think anyone would think that that was like casual, easy to understand reading, right? Yeah. So a black box or the box warning kind of condenses the important stuff into one easy to understand area. The FDA believes that a boxed warning- Like for example, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like cigarettes, like that warning on cigarettes. Correct. That's that Cause would, cancer, lead to yeah, death. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Scary. Gotcha. Something that's a little bit more, uh, you can read it very quickly and understand exactly what the point is. Correct. Okay. Like it gets to the point. Yeah. Yep. Um, FDA believes a box warning would be particularly useful in communicating risks that have been identified in new information for which patients may be unaware, right? So if something changes, this is the perfect opportunity to add a boxed warning to something that was previously unknown information to the general population. Right. Uh, that happens all the time with medications. Like if they find that a medication has a specific interaction or something. So if everyone listened to all people interested in plastic surgery, listened to Beauty and the Surgeon podcast, they probably wouldn't need the black box warning. That's right, because we'd be telling you all about it. Because <laughs> it's an educational podcast. Yes. You get all this information here. But most people don't. And, and it's actually very interesting, and I won't be too long in this, Amy, but most people come in, they're not fully aware of what they're doing. And you really can't blame them for that, because sometimes it's hard to get the good information, hence the reason we made this podcast. Mm -hmm. So it's – this is – this and people want to look, they may want to look at this as like, oh my gosh, this is very concerning. But this is actually a really good step by the FDA to distill down the important information for you patients considering doing breast augmentation or mass spexy aug, breast lift and augmentation and have it like concise and uh, manageable, to, manageable to understand. Yep, exactly. Um, some key things, and these are directly from the FDA that should be mentioned in a box warning is that breast implants are not considered lifetime devices. We cover that in all of our episodes where we talk about implants of any kind, mastopexy, breast dog, mommy makeover, you know, breast implants are not considered a lifetime device. We say it all the time. Yep. When I wake up my kids in the morning, I'm like, how are you doing? And just want you to know that breast implants are not right. permanent. In your lifetime, you will have more <laughs> you, surgery. <laughs> you will have, well, I don't say that to my kids, but like no. <laughs> if you, if you have breast augmentation, you have to expect if you're of reasonable age that you're going to have another surgery in the future. Oh, of any, any age. I tell people, even our patients who come in in their sixties and seventies, who think like, oh, this is my last one. I'm like, hopefully it's not. Hopefully you live long enough that it's not your last surgery. 
You know, um, the chance of developing complications increases over time. Some complications will require more surgery. I would say if you listen to our podcast about breast implant controversies, all <laughs> complications require more surgery for the most part. Yeah. That's just being very honest. Breast implants have been associated with the development of a cancer of the immune system called breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. And that's on the controversies episode, breast implant controversies. Yep. BIAALCL occurs more commonly in patients with textured implants than smooth implants and deaths have occurred from BIAALCL. Breast if not caught early enough. Well, have occurred. Yeah, like they have the, occurred. Yeah, they, have occurred. But to be real clear on this again, like real information uh, if you catch BIAALCL early, um, you have a high likelihood of curing yourself of this problem. It's the people that were in delayed fashion because the information wasn't out there and they, they had persistent issues they didn't know about. Yep. Okay. Yeah. But then that the point of this is just to tell people that people have died from right. this. Not to say you're going to die from this, but it has happened. Breast implants have been associated with symptomatic symptoms. Now, what does that mean? So, I mean, systemic symptoms, symptomatic symptoms. Systemic. You're on the struggle bus today. I am. It's the S And you're, you're kind of a linguist. Like when I listened back to these episodes, my voice is like, who is that dude? And your voice is like soothing. <laughs> And very clear. I listen on and one and then you and a come half. in with your like, what is going on with your brain? I it's your dyslexia mixed things up. Symptomatic thing. symptoms make sense. Yeah. Systemic. Systemic just means whole body. Yeah. And I have I've actually pulled this again from the FDA's recommendation of like one of their examples because the manufacturers are given these guidelines, the ones I just read, and then they can make their own warning essentially. And they that's where they fill it with a bunch of words, so you don't really know what's going on. Well, that's why they can't, and that's why a box warning has to be concise. Exactly. I know, but that's my point. That's why they do that, so nobody reads it. Right, but this one has three points, and I'm going to read them all because they're all very good. Unless you, do you want to read one? Uh, I'll read, read the last the, one. Read the first one. I'll, I'll read the last one. Oh, the last one's the best one. Okay. <laughs> Breast implants are not considered lifetime devices. The longer people have them in, the greater chances are that they will develop complications, some of which some of which will require surgery. Mm. Right? That's basic English. Yeah. yeah. That I struggled to say. Okay, that's okay. Breast implants have been associated with the development of a cancer of the immune system called breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. This cancer occurs more commonly in patients with textured breast implants than smooth implants. Although rates are not well defined, some patients have died from BIA ALCL. Right? Again, so that's good. easy to understand. Yeah. Uh, patients receiving breast implants have reported a variety of systemic systemic symptoms. S systemic <laughs> symptoms, those ones. Such as joint pain, muscle aches, confusion, chronic fatigue, autoimmune disease, and others. And this is getting into that BII scenario. Individual patients' risk for developing these symptoms has not been well established. And that's very much true. Mm -hmm. So in terms of BII, our breast implant illness, we really don't know a lot of what's going on. The fact that FDA is acknowledging this is really huge for those of you that have had BII or maybe you're still dealing with it. Some patients report complete resolution of symptoms when the implants are removed. and uh, Without replacement. Without replacement, yeah. And I personally have seen that. I haven't dealt with many BII cases, but I've definitely melt, dealt with people who have some BII type symptoms mm -hmm fatigue, muscle ache, whatever that may be, and taking the implant out uh, categorically makes them feel better. If that's placebo or not, uh, anecdotally speaking, in my practice. Yeah. And years ago, we actually had a patient who came to us because her rheumatologist recommended that she have her implants removed. And she had never considered you know, that that was something that might be a problem. And this was well before any cases of BII were really in the public. And we did. And you know, I, I still remember you telling her that her rheumatologist was probably completely wrong and that would make no difference at all. Um, but she, we did take out her implants and she was super happy, felt a thousand times better, didn't want them back in. She still had rheumatoid arthritis, but right. she felt anecdotally better. To be very specific, <laughs> what I was saying was it's not going to make your rheumatological disease right. it's not better. It's make your RA go away. Because if you're listening to this and you struggle with BII or you have rheumatologic disease or you have, let's say, autoimmune like disease. lupus or something. Some autoimmune disease. Crohn's. There's not a lot of data out there that says if you remove an implant, these things get better. If there was, we probably wouldn't be implanting these. The FDA would be like, no, this, we're not feeling this. Right. The correlation is too strong. BII is, is a separate set of like symptoms grouped as this condition called BII. They definitely get better, but that's not going to mean that your autoimmune markers would go down, et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, but there is your some pre-existing medical condition would go away. Right, right? but there is some process going on. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm not going to say that I'm the world expert on BII, but I've looked into it. I've read about it. I mean, obviously, I'm implanting these devices, and there's not a lot of data out there. And I'm sure the patients who are, you know, someone who's listening to this who's dealt with it, you feel the same way. And so I feel your pain, by the way. Um, Literally. Well, there's two things. There's not a lot or there's a lot of maybe not super reliable. Right. Because a lot Very of this anecdotal. stuff is anecdotal. You go on the Internet. It's a bunch of patients talking, which, you know, God bless. But, you know, in reality, that's one person's experience. Yep. They're which, an N1. Uh, if we we can't say words like what we went through in the past two years, if you talk to people about their experience, you just go down a rabbit hole. You're never coming out. And that's how you can't do medicine that way. But the fact that FDA has taken a, a frontline stance on this is really, really important. So those of you who, quote unquote, have been struggling with BII, just know the FDA kind of has your back. And that's good. And I think we, I think we should be upfront about that. Yeah. And we talked about that in our again, in our episode about breast, breast implant controversies, that it makes sense if you implant any device, not just a breast implant, like this is well documented with other types of implants. In some people, it can trigger a very inflammatory reaction. So what does your body do when it's having like massive amounts of inflammation, your joints are going to ache. You might be tired. Like your body thinks it's fighting something that it isn't. Right. You know, so does it make sense from a physiological level? Like why that would be the case with any implant, not breast implants and specifically? Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. All of us are, uh, most of us have had some sort of inflammatory condition in our life. Mm -hmm. I have uh, some lateral epicondylitis right now. Of course you had to go into yourself. <laughs> Just trying to read. Just so you know, Amy and I talked about her lateral epicondylitis. Uh, about an hour ago. So this is what Amy and I did. We talk about our disorders. Um, <laughs> I mean, what else are we going to talk about? On I mean, what are we going to talk about? We're like, yeah. we're like two old men sitting on a dock somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. like telling about what hurts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, oh, my elbow's painting. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, I, you know, any type of inflammation can lead to that problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think for you know, for the FDA, what they're trying to do is get out in front of this. Mm -hmm. I think they're trying to avoid the problems we have with I'm, – I'm just reading between the lines. I don't know this. I don't know anybody at the FDA. The problems that we have with uh, BIA, ALCL, that kind of like kind of snuck up on us. You know, there was this stuff going around in the background. People were having these like swelling in the breast. And a couple of patients, oh, I heard somebody had a lymphoma. I remember this in like 2017 and 16. And, uh, you know, kind of hit this uh, crescendo and then the FDA really kind of clamped down. And that's where all this kind of started. Um, there's a long historical history of the FDA regulating silicone and saline breast implants. Silicone breast implants were taken off the market. Uh, were they on the market when you started working for me? Amy? They had just come back. So they actually came back on in 2007. Yeah. Um, Mentor started, I think their Mentor and McGann started their trials again With in 2006. McGann is now Allergan. Yep. yep. Um, so 2006 were, was when they started their trials back up. But by 2007, there was enough of the trial data back that they had re-released them onto the market. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yes, the whole time we've worked together, um, we've used silicone breast implants. Which are definitely superior. Yeah. And, and again, I'm going to go back to the same point and then we're going to keep going here. A saline and silicone implant both have silicone shells. And whatever chemicals are in the shell. Right. Which and could the be the cause And by the, the way, the shells are exactly the <laughs> yeah. same because these implant companies are not going to spend the money, the R&D money, and the money to get it approved by the FDA to have a different shell in one and not the other. They're all they're all the same, same shell. shells. We're with, all made the with, same shell. Made with the same mandal. Yep. <laughs> We're all in the same shell. Yeah. Well, let's – yes. Let's get checked. Uh, test for C-reactive protein. Yep. Is that in the yeah. wellness test? Oh, perfect. So, so yeah. yeah, let's get checked. Yeah, if you want to get we get your C-reactive protein, use the link down below. You get the problem with the C-reactive protein. It, it really doesn't tell you much that you're other than the fact that you're inflamed. Yep. So, but <laughs> but it will tell you how much. <laughs> it's a good place to it's start. It's not going to be. It's sensitive, not specific. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. So this was the question you kind of posed at the beginning: Why the changes? Like why now? And this is what's really interesting <laughs> about. Uh, Maybe plastic surgery, plastic surgeons. So in 2019, there was a big meeting of all plastic surgeons, right? And they discussed. It was kind of like uh, in um, what's the what's the um, Gandalf uh, where they all meet before they go into Mordor. Uh, what was? Yeah, the. Uh, I don't know. The Fellowship of the Rings. The Fellowship, oh, Fellowship of the, of the Rings. Rings. We yeah. all came together at the Elfin. That actually is very true. Yeah. yeah. Before you know, we were going to Mordor. Yeah. To discuss what was going on, essentially, you know, the um, 
there was a lot of talk back in 2019, 2018 about BII, BIALCL, like all of this was really in the news. It was out there. Um, that's when we did our podcast about it. Um, it was very much in, in the forefront of people's minds. It was in minds. the zeitgeist. It was. So at this meeting, they kind of discussed all these recommendations, right? So in 2019, these were, and actually they were finalized. So September of 2020, the FDA finalized their recommendations. But they are now required. <laughs> So I guess it's kind of one of those things like if you are recommended to do something you don't, oh, well, now you have to. Right. It's kind of like that. So these were all so, things. That, so these were – most of these things were already getting tossed around. They just made it a requirement. Correct. Okay. Because it, it was not implemented to their satisfaction. And that probably had something to do with the manufacturer is not coming – Right. Well, the manufacturer, no manufacturer wants to put a box warning on their device unless they are forced. Yeah. Let's be real. <laughs> Which I find very funny with this because this whole tracking thing, uh, the manufacturers immediately s sent out like emails to everyone saying, you have to get us your numbers. Like they put it on the, the on the providers, which I think is. Well, which it should be, though. I mean, if you're having a device know, implanted at a hospital, but they should know what they're putting they in you. They immediately do what everyone does, which is like, get this responsibility get can, get away from me. Like. <laughs> I want as far away from this because we need profits and, you know, and this is the problem in healthcare. Uh, profits, businesses, sales do not really always correspond with ethical care of Greed. patients. Yeah. Um, you know, doing the right thing and that kind of stuff. And, you know, I think that that's where having a reasonable and, and good relationship with your surgeon is really important because ultimately, and we've talked about this before, first do no harm is what Amy and I and all people in healthcare go back to and uh, specifically physicians because you take that oath and that's part of this you know education and telling people the risk is first do no harm it's explaining to them exactly what you're getting into so they understand what well, the future may hold there are definitely plastic surgeons that we spoke with several years ago who would straight up say that they don't believe BII exists that they think those patients are crazy um, or histrionic or whatever, that they're nuts, that breast implants are 100% safe and that there is no correlation to Why this cancer. Why are you divulging personal conversations we're having? <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying like that's real. You know, like that's unfortunately when you're the patient and you are presenting with these symptoms and you're being told by your doctor that you are crazy. Right. You know, that's a frustrating place to be in. Right. And, so, and it's hard because. The risk is small. <laughs> risk. We don't know a lot about it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it presents differently in different people. Third, we have no test to for, do it. Well, for BII, there is a for, test for, for BII. For BII, ALCL. I'm not talking about BIA ALCL. And go to that episode because we explained that. Um, and then, I mean, and then you're relying on a surgeon who's not really good at assessing people's complaints. They're not like an internist or something where you're sitting down and trying to figure things out. Uh, you know, that's probably not the best person. Like when you come in with these vague symptoms, I'm having pain. I don't feel My right. I, hurt. I'm I have tired. brain fog. Mm -hmm. And you're saying this to a surgeon who like really their mindset is, well, if you have a problem, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to do surgery. It creates that tension there uh, also. And, and that's, I think, where we run into problems too, even if the surgeon is well-intentioned. Correct. And I'm not defending surgeons. I'm just saying that it creates this. It's a, w a weird cutout yep. for these surgeons when they're dealing with that. It is. And, you know, most most surgeons are extremely ethical. So they don't want to believe that something they're doing could harm someone. Right. right? And that's the other part of it. So there's this bias there. Yeah. There's a yeah. The, the bias. Your anchoring bias. Anchoring bias. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. So 100 percent. I totally agree with this. And I've. I personally, just so you know, in my practice, I try to confront those anchoring biases all the time. Amy and I do. We're very like almost brutally honest with each other, uh, which can be painful. But uh, <laughs> I was like, I want to go back to my dream world and I live in it over here. This like, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. Yeah, yeah. And she is, uh, does not allow that to happen, which is good. And you need to do that in surgery because that's how you avoid problems. Yeah, it doesn't. It may not always make you better, maybe have better outcomes, but it definitely lets you, uh, how, allows you to avoid bad outcomes when you have that brutal honesty and avoid anchoring biases. Yeah, and that's really what the FDA said. This is directly from the FDA. The FDA is requiring these restrictions based on its findings that the available information indicates such restrictions are necessary to provide a reasonable assurance of the device's safety and effectiveness. Specifically, helps patients better understand the risks associated with breast implants and the risk of BIA ALCL. Because let's be real, we did a podcast on these things several years ago when most doctors would tell a patient straight to their face that 
there's no correlation. These things don't exist. Why? Because they wanted this patient to do a breast dog. They want to make money. And I'm not saying that in a mean or malicious way, but you just, you don't want to hear it, right? Like, no, no, no. I do breast implants all the time. My patients are fine. I've never had a patient of cancer I've from never them. had a BIA, right. LCL. Must I've not only be read about that in an article. Mm-hmm. On Your risk is so low. It's only with textured implants. Like there was a lot of misinformation around it. And so- you know, this is really, again, like I go back to this, it's for patient safety. Like you should understand the risk of something that you are choosing to implant in your body. This is not a man. This is not a pacemaker. Like this is your choice. I was laughing the other day. I was thinking like, you know, not every person, we all know a lot of people, not every person wants to know a lot of things. We all know somebody who's like, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to go through life and just figure it out. You know, <laughs> and whenever those people come in our office, they're like, oh God, you guys suck. You know, I'm like, no, we got to talk about this, but I don't want to talk about it. But you have to. Well, now the FDA is going to require that every patient and fills you got to go through checklist. the checklist. Yep. Like a literally a checklist. And if you don't, you will not be able to buy implants. Like the manufacturers cannot legally sell to you anymore mm. if you are not using this checklist. How are they going to check that? How are they going to check the checklist? Well, so I don't actually know that yet, but I'm assuming you have to submit it when you submit the serial numbers. I mean, could you falsify it? Yes. And if you're doing that, like you should absolutely not be allowed to do surgery. <laughs> If you're falsifying your medical records. Oh, I'm sure that will be falsified. I'm point. sure it will. And I'm sure there's going to be doctors who lose their privileges to order implants. Mm-hmm. I mean, but again, if your doctor is willing to falsify your medical records, that's your you're, bigger problem. You kind of sound like Maury Povich right now. Like you're going down this road of like, are you the father? Do you disagree that a no, doctor of course. can falsify medical records? I, mean, I can't imagine there's a lot of surgeons falsifying medical records. Right. That's what I mean. So yeah. when the requirement is made, I mean, you're you're either going to do it or you're not. Right. Like, And if you're not going to do it, well, then there's a big problem. So I guess the probably a different way to say this, if you go in for breast augmentation after or starting December 1st, 2021, and you don't do a checklist and the doctor doesn't sign it, then they're like literally doing the thing, the and wrong thing. You don't thing. sign it. Yeah. Or you don't. Or you both have to sign yep. it. Yeah. And that checklist goes over all the risks that we talked about. It's a one page thing. It's not that long and it probably take five minutes. It's quick. It's I think it's like 15 questions yeah. that you have to go through. And there's always been, I mean, there have always been regulations in place by the FDA, specifically around breast implants, specifically around silicone breast implants when they did come back on the market and they are still only approved for use in women over the age of 22. Like that's a requirement that most people don't know about with silicone breast implants, Right. There's probably someone listening to this who got silicone implants less than 22. I'm sure there is. And yeah, I mean, in the United States, can you technically justify off label usage in some situations? Yes, you can. As with anything, there's always a loophole, right? Botox is off label. Botox is used off label all the time. Which, like, yeah. when you do cosmetic Botox, that's an off label use. Uh, that's not true. There's FDA indication for glabella, for glabella forehead, and um, right cross, tides, and crow's feet, feet, but mm-hmm. not like the chin lip, the chin. And the lip. Yeah. No. Yeah axillary. I mean, those are things that are off label. Hands. Yeah. So I think this is really what I wanted to get to with all of this, because this is what happened when there was information released about BIA ALCL in the beginning. I have implants. Should I be concerned? Right. That's what everybody, I still get calls and emails from patients who say, oh my gosh, I just heard my implants are recalled, which they're not. Go listen to our podcast about the breast implant recall. Your implants are not recalled. If they're implanted in you, they're not. It was only for implants that are not inside people. What do you think? What would you say to this, Dr. Martin? What would you say to a patient who said, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. I have breast implants. Um, I think it's the answer's mixed. I think uh, breast augmentation is the most common surgery we do. And we've been doing it since the 70s. Yeah, 300,000 plus women in the United States get breast implants every year. And that's even more worldwide. And so there's really not a lot of surgeries that have that much volume, that much history. So the safety profile of breast augmentation, I think, is legit. Like, I think you can do it and feel comfortable you're going to be fine with a reputable surgeon. The problem really lies in afterwards, because once you make the decision for breast augmentation, you're basically saying that I'm okay with future su- surgeries. Mm-hmm. And that's- And the other risks associated with and breast And the other risks, which, again, are, are rare, Okay. Again, this is, gets into data, and these days everyone. Oh, I like, don't mean I'm not meaning major things. I mean like implant extrusion, need yeah, for yeah. additional surgery, right. or like infection, yeah, or infection. Ca- or capsular contracture. Yeah, there's or other which, risks. We should just do an episode on capsular contracture. We have one. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean that that does happen. It can happen really quickly. So there's definitely like consequences that you're inheriting if you decide to do breast augmentation, even things that are less scary than like lymphoma or BII like capsular contracture, like asymmetry, like changing your nipple sensation. 
but that's that's with any surgery. They all have risks. It's just it's there's something with breast augmentation that I don't know. It's just it's a little more involved. Like there's a little more to it, more meat in the bone uh, when you talk about postoperatively recovery and long term. Like with a face and neck lift, you have risks related to nerve injury and infection and scar formation. Uh, and those are rare, just like so, some of these other problems you see with breast augmentation. But once you get through the surgery, the risk it, goes away. That risk kind of goes away. And then you're only, it's not even a risk. I mean, the reality is that, you know, in 10 years, you may need a face and neck lift again because you start to, you, you continue to age and things change. But it's not like you're inheriting this lifelong obligation right. or responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it's kind of a gray area. We have these conversations with our patients. We have these exact conversations with our patients. They're not surprised. They're making a calculated decision. Well, and this was more of the person who already has implants is who I was meaning. And someone who has implants, as long as you're doing okay, you're probably going to continue to do okay. I mean, that's the reality of it. Uh, I People come in all the time. They're like, my implant, I'm t- I had implants 10 years ago. Uh, they all look fine. They feel fine. Don't I need to get them replaced? I'm like, absolutely not. So come back and whenever things start to change. So I, I think if you have implants and you're, you're doing okay, I don't think you have to be overtly concerned. Unless you start having medical issues or something pops up, then you should consider some of these things we talked about. Yeah, and that's that's what I would say. And I, I guess I'm the one who feels most of these questions from patients who are concerned. And if you have implants and you feel good and your implants are soft and you're happy, you should not be extra concerned. Now, should you also follow the recommendations for screening of your implants? Yes. Right. I was going to get to that. The MRI is important. It can tell you if it's rupture. That's the gold standard. It's really the only way to know for sure. Right. A lot of times insurance companies will try to divert you to do an ultrasound, which is not going to be good enough as an MRI. Because if you have a micro rupture, it's a little area, the ultrasound may not pick it up. But you can get some information from an ultrasound. Yep. It's, just, it's not the gold standard. You could get information about fluid versus rupture. Um, there are some things that diagnostic ultrasound can be helpful for. But MRI is not going to be covered by most people's insurance. And just because it's a re- recommendation of the FDA, this was an elective surgery. So they don't have an obligation to cover this. So it is something to think about. And that goes back into that conversation before surgery. What do you think, think an about. MRI of the breast costs? You have to have two different views, <laughs> an axial and sagittal. Yeah. So what, like 900 bucks? No, I was going to say, I mean, you're probably paying, if you're self-paying, at least probably two to 3,000. I can't imagine it's that much. I'm serious. Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. That, that would be my guess. I mean, I you don't- think Let's Get Checked does breast MRIs? <laughs> I mean, I know what- helps. I know what the ortho group told me it was going to cost to MRI my ankle when it was broken. Yeah, the I, orthopedic surgeons are the- Yeah, when the, I decided to just know. They're bandits. <laughs> Yeah. And they're not Robin Hood. They don't rob from the whatever. They yeah. just keep it all. But I mean, there are self-pay options for these diagnostic tests, especially because, you know, they're not commonly covered, especially if you. I would bet, honestly, we should do some research. I bet it would be like, you know, less than 1500 bucks. <laughs> Dr. Martin, who's like, oh, yeah, I paid $50. For that. I'm like, well, the credit card bill says it was $700. <laughs> like, I don't remember that. Really? It was that much? Yeah. Listen. I'm pretty sure it was 50. <laughs> I create my reality. <laughs> The price is right. <laughs> yes. oh, I'm, oh I'm so bad at that. Oh my gosh. But, I'm, fr- I'm frugal by nature, but when it comes to like me being busy during the day, like uh, the wheels fall off a little bit sometimes. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening. And again, if you have breast implants and you feel good and you love your implants, there is nothing to be afraid of now just because of some new requirements of the FDA for the implant manufacturers. Keep your implants. You're, you're doing great. Um, if you are interested in finding out more information, there are two links in the description box below that go to the FDA's website about the new restrictions and also about BIALCL specifically. If you want to learn more, we also have a great podcast episode on that, um, on the recall that was several years ago and also on breast implant controversies in general. So uh, this is the time now where Dr. Martin, you're going to want to see a phone number swirl around your head. So Nils is a CGI around my head. Mm-hmm. And the we're going to have like sound effects with it coming in. Yes. Or he might put it right in this area. Right. You can yeah. find all the links to our social media down below and also the phone number where if you'd like to leave us a voicemail, we would appreciate it. We love answering your questions. That number is 303-630-9038. It really does help when you share this podcast with your friends. Um, just helps people find our information. Hopefully this was something that was it's very important, and hopefully you found it useful. And like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is over a thousand now. All right, and ding the bell for notifications. And ding, 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 ding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, such a good episode. This is your post recap recap coming. Yeah, no, it's such a good episode. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. Uh, knowledge should not make you nervous. Okay, 
we're going to say this one more time. We see a high majority of the patients that come in with breast implants and they're doing okay and they're going to do well for a long time. Mm -hmm. you did, so if you made a decision 10 or 20 years ago and you're like, oh, crap, don't feel that way. That's not the way this works. But it's really moving forward. We're, we're trying to right the wrongs maybe of the past where information was not given appropriately to patients. And that's always a good thing. Okay. Yeah, or not known. I mean, some of this just wasn't even known. Yeah. So. That's all I had to say. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. We hope to see you hear us next time. See you later. <laughs> Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked offers fast, affordable, and completely confidential health testing for everything from STDs, male and female hormones, and even COVID-19 right from the comfort of your own home. And remember, new customers and listeners of our podcast get 20% off by using our URL, trylgc.com slash beauty, and be sure to use the code beauty20 at checkout. That's try, T-R-Y-L-G-C.com slash beauty, and use the code beauty20, beauty, B-E-A-T-U-Y, two zero at checkout. Get checked. It's the right thing to do.